and it's now seven o'clock on Monday the 16th of April. A very good morning to you. You're watching the BBC's Breakfast Time. The news headlines this morning, the world of show business has been paying tribute to the late Tommy Cooper, who collapsed and died last night. Two people have died in a fire last night in Glasgow. Seven others were injured and police say there were suspicious circumstances. I was lying in my bed and I was no well. I was listening to my granny's, she had a wee radio with VHF on it, the music in the early posts and things like taxis, whatever. And it came out saying they were a fire on Bank End Street. It was absolutely shocking. The thick, thick smoke would have just engulfed that flat. So the police knew immediately that this was a murder. There was no other explanation other than it was started deliberately. This had to be cracked. Vicious gangsterism aimed at controlling a major sector of the city's ice cream trade. The driver came in to me one day and said, well, I've been given an offer I can't refuse. It obviously sounded gangsterish. T.C. Campbell slashed, stabbed his way through the east end of Glasgow. He was a terrible man. Violence was always going to happen. A total of seven men were in the dock at the High Court in Glasgow on charges ranging from attempted murder to assault and robbery. It's probably one of the biggest trials that Scotland had ever seen. Steele claims he was framed and shouldn't be in prison. You're watching two men that had done more to show up our criminal justice system than anybody else had ever known before. If you have much acquaintance with the criminal justice system, you learn very quickly not to expect too much. We have the laws and the rules of evidence for a reason. They are to be protected. We are living with the consequences of this case, suspicion of the police, the beleaguered feeling of people on these outlying estates. How did these things happen? It ruined my life, it ruined my family's life, it ruined a lot of lives. This is a film for people about the city they live in. The second city of the empire had run out of space. It had to change. When I went into the council, every week, and this was in the 1970s, every month we would get a little uh, card which showed us the number of houses that had been built in that last month. So that was still the key driver. But Glasgow's future is planned out in the heads of planners, stage by stage, modeled in balsa and plastic, presented to the public and the representatives, argued and approved. The original intent of the schemes, as we call them in Glasgow, the, the, the housing estates, was to give people somewhere decent to live. Because it was so densely populated, they knocked everything down and they built these purpose-built housing estates, but outside the city centre. Glaswegians raised in a bustling industrial city would bring up their own children surrounded by green fields and lochs. I was about 12 years old when I lived in Rukizi. I was aware we didn't have a lot. There was not many cars around. There was just lots of people around. If I look back, yes, I'd say it was poverty, but at the time, I didn't feel it was poverty. Remember that when people moved into these houses, they had bathrooms, they had verandas, they had bedrooms to themselves after living in very poor conditions. There was no sort of stranger danger, everybody was out, there was no cares, it was a community. Um, it was, I would say, a happy place. It was a massive step up. People had been living in rooms and kitchens. But of course, in Glasgow doing that, I'm afraid they relied too much on architects and didn't look enough to people who understood society better. So they built 
brand new houses, indoor toilets. But they built them in Drumchapel, in Easter House, in Castle Milk, and they forgot to build shops, and they didn't build pubs, and they didn't lay on proper bus routes. So you isolated people by pushing them out to the periphery. There was not much around um, to do. There was no entertainment on the scheme. We found his own entertainment. So one of the things that happened was grocery vans would come round and, and fish vans and, you know, ice cream vans. And it was the high point of a lot of people's day. People would say to each other, the van, the van! <laughs> and all, hundreds of children would run out into the street to get to the van. Our Ketty brothers had started in the late 50s with one ice cream van out in the east end of Glasgow. They'd heard that this new housing scheme had been built with virtually no shops. It was quite simple for them to sell their ice cream, obviously, but also lemonade, crisps, cigarettes, even pipe tobacco. It wasn't just an ice cream van, it was more almost like a general store. And they found it obviously quite profitable. They'd built up a few runs, and then they started to hire out vans to other drivers. And when I joined them in the late 70s, they had, I would say, between 20 and 25 vans operating all over Glasgow. By the early 80s, um, we had managed to build that up to almost 50 vans, uh, all hired out to self-employed drivers and all doing quite well. They would be operating at, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night, whereas what shops there were probably shut the doors at half past five or six. There were a few other companies operating from the north side of the city, and there was 50 ICES who operated out from premises in Garfamlo. All you had to do in Glasgow, anyway, was get a street trading licence, and you're allowed to operate anywhere you wanted. While well, ice cream vans compensated for a lack of shops, the lack of facilities and growing poverty in housing schemes would lead to an increase in antisocial behaviour. The gangs were, were very, very territorial and they would set up no-go areas. You could not go into Easter House because teams had different roads and it meant that not only were things quite suffocating within the schemes, you couldn't get out of the schemes. Even young children, you know, from 10 years old, you would see them running about the streets late at night with pickaxe handles and knives and what they called chips. Because you had the various places round about, Easter House itself, the, the police station in Easter House it was what, Fort Apache. I mean, it was surrounded by bad guys. The gangs and the schemes were not the gangsters as such as, as we would know them from TV and film. They were street gangs, essentially. And generally, it was, it was what we might call now disaffected youth who came together as a form of protection. If you weren't in a gang, then you could be fair game to anyone. They would go into the next area where, from where they lived and they would just start a war there with the other juvenile gangs. And there was a lot of serious assaults and then they would burn a building down just for the hell of it, you know. And they, they'd each try to take over each other's territory. That's what it was all about. There was people running about with firearms. There was people running about with bayonets, hatchets. They used to fight. Oh, every night you would have fights and you had to get in there and sort it out. And I must admit, sometimes it was, it was close to who was going to win, you know. We always managed to win in the end, but it was a few tough nights out there. I think what was more important to them was their egos, and they felt as though they owned where they lived and it was nothing to do with the police. And they told you that quite often, that um, they're there, they were doing their own policing. In schemes such as Rikese, Garthamlik and Easter House, 
it was not only gangs that had become territorial. If a driver came in to me and said, another van's trying to break into my run, then our legitimate way of trying to combat that would be to offer the driver another van. We would not charge him for the hire of the van, but he would have to supply a spare driver. And the idea would be where uh, originally one van, our van, had been operating in a run. There would now be three vans, the opposition and two of ours. It was left to be a kind of free-for-all. So I suppose violence w was always, was always going to happen. Could begin as something as, as simple as double stopping. So if you're on a run with another a rival driver, you would go in the same route as him, but try and get ahead of him uh, so that you got to the next stop. So a few would then resort to more direct action. Now, that could be rushing out and squirting the raspberry liquid that they put on the top of the ice cream cones to give them another flavour onto the windscreen. Now, that was so sticky that when they tried to wipe it off, it would smear the windscreen, so that would hold that driver back. It developed, it degenerated, I think is a better word, to actual violence when vans would be attacked and smashed, bricks would be thrown. I was told that some drivers would pay uh, some of the youths in, in various streets and various schemes to attack their rival's van and smash it up. One of the best runs in Marchetti Brothers had been built up um, about five, ten years before by um, a guy who lived in Carntine. And his turnover in a week was almost double what a lot of the other vans were doing. The driver came in to me one day and said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to chuck it. I've been given an offer I can't refuse. And I said, well, what do you mean you've been given an offer you can't refuse? It obviously sounded gangsterish. And he said, well, TC told me I, I, I had to get out, there, out of the area. I hadn't heard the TC. Tommy Campbell used to say to me that he tried to deal with people in the way that they dealt with him. If I was somebody that was in the habit of using a knife, then he would use a knife. It was his version of the Chicago way. But he had a reputation. Uh, a very heavy reputation for dealing with people. Tommy Campbell came from the from the East End. He came from a, a quite a large family, and uh, his, his his father was a criminal. He drifted into to the gangs. He eventually became the leader of of the Gaucho, one of the, the street gangs. It's well known that T.C. Uh, Campbell um, was was very handy with a knife, with a sword, with a, a pickaxe handle. He was a, a fearsome gang fighter. He did 10 years for mobbing and rioting, which was essentially a, a gang fight. He came out uh, of that. He became more and more involved with, with big time crime and was part of the Berlanuk team. It was maybe the first time I came across guys who were travelling all the time to commit crime. They would go anywhere. Ayrshire, Blanetshire, up the A9. They would do post offices, banks, that kind of thing. Um, and they were reasonably successful. Breaking through the night, very organised, and then back to Glasgow with the stuff and get rid of it as soon as they could. The guy that really started them off was the Tom, Tom McGraw, Thomas McGraw. Tam McGraw was very, very feared. He was one of the hardest men you'll get. He seemingly, but you always heard, he seemingly had his finger in every pie. Um, and he never, ever got caught for very much because he wasn't a stupid man. I lived in Berlanark. And I think because it was quite close, it was felt that, you know, these are just people to stay away from. They were not heroes to us. 
I think he probably was a dangerous man and I think he probably would be capable of, of violence himself if he had to be. The sort of reputation of criminals was that they were mad and brutal. You didn't really want anything to do with them. You wouldn't raise their name. I, I came across Tom McGraw as a tour, first time I arrested him. Thomas McGraw was a very affable guy. I think if he'd have been in any other honest endeavor, it would have been a success. Tam ran the team. If TC was in his team, he would have to do what Tam was doing. Eventually, Thomas Campbell decided that he wanted to go straight. He had a, a family, but he admitted that straight didn't mean necessarily being straight. It was, it was more sort of slightly wiggled. Thomas Campbell had bought a van. He got a bank loan and he bought a van. And he got his uh, his supplies, his goods from 50s ICs. Fortunately, he, he wouldn't get a street trading license because of his criminal record. His wife had the street trading license. Thomas Campbell and Tam McGraw, from what I understand, had been friends. He helped Thomas Campbell to buy his ice cream van. And I'm, I, I understand that Tam McGraw eventually bought into 50s ICES. I'd heard that they moved into the ice cream. It's a natural, natural question. If he saw, if Tam saw a break in, he would go for it. Tam McGraw continued uh, in criminality and occasionally tried to entice him back, but he, he wanted nothing to do with it. As the focus of Glasgow's organised crime changed, one branch of Strathclyde Police became increasingly busy. Glasgow on its own had a flying squad, which was known as the Serious Crime Squad, a team of detectives made up from different divisions in the city to concentrate on getting to crime quickly and or dealing with major criminals in the city. The Serious Crime Squad um, were quite a legend in their own lunchtime and uh, there were quite a few um, famous figures in amongst them. Well, at that time, the 80s, I think we were running about... Sir Clyde would maybe run about 80 murders a year then. You know, you're nearly two a week. The figures in Strathclyde can only be seen as a severe setback. The crime rate has gone up by 12 and a half percent. But it's hard work. There's nothing like arresting a bad man, you know, arresting a bad man. There's nothing like it. The police at the height of the, what they called the ice cream wars, obviously were, were trying to stamp it out, trying to, to get to the bottom of it. So they put their own van on the streets and the idea was that they would then be undercover, essentially. And, you know, if they saw any trouble, if they heard anything, they would be able to, to, to beat Johnny on the spot. At one point, the serious crime squad were involved and they had their own objectives. We would go out, but because we weren't quite as large as they were, we were nicknamed occasionally as the, the serious chime squad, which we thought was quite funny. If you had a good run, you could make a good living. If you had a good run and were willing to sell stolen goods, you could make a great living. So what Thomas Campbell said was that he was going straight-ish. In other words, he wouldn't steal the goods, but he would sell it off the back of his van. Just in time for Christmas, Parkhead Forge was closed. I'm 44 years of age. Where am I going to get a job now? A lot of heavy-duty factories had closed. So if you had a small new engineering company, instead of putting it in the east end of Glasgow. You would put it in because of government grants and East Kilbride, Irvine, and all the other new towns. Uh, and the people who had the skills moved out to these new towns. Its old offices have been converted into the employment exchange, a euphemism to raise a rare smile from men tramping the road to redundancy. Areas like the east end and housing schemes have been denuded of jobs and also denuded of the skilled people for these jobs. So the place became quite 
quite blighted. Equally, um, some people were doing quite well out of it. But you could see it in the city centre of Glasgow where there was uh, new pubs and restaurants which hadn't been there before, places like Charlie Park, as there was a, almost like a glamour and a glitz coming to Glasgow. I, I always thought of it as Glasgow at that time in the 80s was moving from a black and white movie into a colour movie. You had people like Charlie Nicholas, you know, footballers who had a bit of a glamour. In a city which so often seems to choose its heroes from among the big, the bad and the not necessarily sober, Michael Kelly is a bit of an oddity. When I became Lord Provost in 1980, Glasgow was plagued by a horrendous image. And that had real consequences. Images of radical Glasgow that have lingered across the years are an inconvenience to modern business. You know, if you wanted to attract a chief executive, in those days he would say to his wife, we're going to Glasgow, and she would say, no, no we're not going to Glasgow. What was your image of the city before you came here? Uh, to be honest with you, very poor. I suppose one had an image of the Gorbals, one had an image of, uh, of urban violence. Glasgow was religious bigotry, urban deprivation, unemployment, poverty, rain. Well, we couldn't do anything about the rain, but I thought we could do something about the other things. There you go. All over the city, smiling little men proclaim that Glasgow is miles better, a slogan Dr Kelly will introduce to the rest of the country on Monday. We weren't going to cure deprivation, we weren't going to cure unemployment, we weren't going to smarten up the schemes. That, that was a longer term project. So I decided in a practical way, tackle the problems that you can tackle. Don't chew off stuff that you'll never ever swallow. Today the city launches a half million pound campaign to convince the world that Gla Glasgow isn't that bad. It's called Glasgow's Better, uh, it's, it's called Glasgow's Miles Better. Glasgow is miles better, but not miles better for some of the people that lived in the housing schemes, it was very much um, a superficial thing. If you lived in certain areas that were well-to-do, then Glasgow was miles better. The city's Lord Provost, who's uh, brought his uh, thing with him this Mr. morning. Uh, Mr. Who? Mr. Harpy. Mr. Harpy. Harpy. Uh, Mr. Harpy. Yes, well, with a smile. But behind Glasgow's new happy facade lay a conflict in danger of boiling over. Ice cream enjoys a markup of substantially more than 100%. And on a warm summer day, a van may sell the better part of a thousand cones at hefty prices. If an incident, a serious incident, had occurred, then it would be reported to the police by myself, either personally or by phone. I came into the office one morning to find that three of our vans operating in different areas in Glasgow had actually been smashed up. All the windows had been broken, the windscreens, the headlamps. There'd been no attempt to rob the vehicles, they'd just been attacked. I became quite well known in all of the stations around Glasgow. One in Castle Milk, one in the Denison area, and one in Cran Hill. All on the one night? All on the one night, and according to the descriptions given to me by the drivers, although they couldn't identify anyone, obviously, they could describe the people concerned, it was the same people who had literally gone round Glasgow and attacked three of our vans all on the one night. I have a recollection of receiving a telephone call at the office. That telephone call was just threatening, not so much me personally, it was threatening the, the premises that um, they might be torched. Jimmy Mitchell was uh, the driver who had one of the, the runs in Gartharmelo, and it was one of the most popular ones. Jim came in to me and explained that um, another van was trying to encroach on the run, as was our norm. When this did happen, we, um, we basically gave him, gave him an, ex an extra van, free of charge. He had to pay for the stop. He had to pay for the spare driver. And in this case, the spare driver was Andy Doyle. They unkindly called Andrew Doyle fat boy. And it's not pleasant to say that because, it, you know, I've seen photographs of him. He was just, he was big. Uh, he's far from fat. A young, heavy set boy 
but very, very friendly and cheerful and outgoing, which would be ideal for operating in an ice cream van. Within weeks of beginning work in one of the most lucrative ice cream runs in the city, Andrew Doyle became the target of threats and intimidation. I believe that what happened was he was coming home after a night in the van. Now, he was three up, I think, uh, and just got jumped in the coast. I, I don't know whether he knew who he did that or not, but he, he, he said he didn't. He certainly didn't want the police report. A van that had been attacked by a couple of thugs with masks and ski masks and um, balaclavas with baseball bats, and the windows were smashed. And this was and Andy's spare van that we had put into the run. There's no doubt that he had been told to get off, and he said no. It was as simple as that. He just refused to go. He was quite ambitious, actually. He was wanting to make a business, and that's why he would not give in. Umpteen times he told me, I'm not giving in. I'm not giving him up. The following morning, we had replaced the windows. He went back out again. And I think a week, 10 days later, a shotgun was fired through the windscreen of the van. That was just one night we were out and about, and the call came out to say shots fired. Andrew Doyle was driving the van, and a car pulled in ahead of them. A man piled out the car with a balaclava shotgun and blasted the windscreen. We attended immediately, but as usual, they were long gone. I think that was probably the strongest message that had ever been put to him. And that's what it was, it was a message. Um, but he was still indignant that nobody was going to scare him off. He never actually would tell you who it was, because it's, it's a silly way they have of not wanting to be known as a grass. That's, that's the way it always went. That's why you were struggling to try and make a, 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 a crime or an arrest. This using a shotgun, using a firearm, was an escalation. As the violence grew, rumours spread that criminals were using ice cream vans as a quick and mobile way to deal drugs. Many van routes also covered areas that overstretched authorities were struggling to police. I was in the drug squad at the time, and we were aware that the ice cream vans were selling heroin. So you went out and you got your bottle of lemonade and you got your ice cream and you got a, a bag of smack. We were never pulled in to do anything about it. Quite honestly, it would have been so, so difficult to catch them at it. The difficulty was you would old, old women would come out to the van to buy things, but they would be getting pushed out the road because somebody was desperate to get himself fixed. So you had to be very careful about how you treated them, you know? There has been a strong rumor that the vans were selling drugs. What I would say to them is, show me the evidence. Where are the people who were arrested for selling drugs at the time? I've never spoken to anybody who got drugs off the back of a van, who sold drugs off the back of a van. I spoke to one former uh, drug lord. He said, for one thing, where are you going to stash them if the police give you a pull? You're going to go in a high-speed chase with your chimes going. We regularly checked to make sure that there was no drugs on any of the vans, and it was spot checks. The drivers didn't know when we were going to do it. I had made an appointment to go in and see um, an inspector in the CID in Baird Street Police Station, the north side of the city. Andy Doyle's van had been attacked a few times. We were in the course of talking. He told us he would have to cut everything short because there'd been an incident the previous evening at Bankend Street in Rochese. 
Bank End Street, it's still there, but it's completely different now, but it's right above the M8 motorway. And from the top flat uh, of, of the flats when they were there, you could probably look over and see uh, certainly the roofs of Berlini Prison. It was a dead end street uh, with, uh, in 1983-84, just a row of, of tenement properties. They were tenements because each of the apartments, each of the flats was accessed by a common stairway. There would be a veranda sort of idea, the front door to the flat and beside it what people called the cellar. If you had a bike, you'd put your bike in there, etc. You know, Rock is, is it's not part of Easter House. It's, it's just a very small scheme that's sort of sandwiched in beside the motorway. I lived in the close and we lived in the third floor of um, Millencroft Road. And the Doyle family lived on Back End Street and they lived in the third floor. So if I opened my bedroom windows, I saw their bedroom windows. The Doyle flat was was particularly busy because they had various family members in. And they were staying over. The Doyle family are this um, working class family. They're not involved in any criminality at all. They're just a good living, hard working family. I didn't know Christine. Um, I only saw Christine pushing the push chair with the baby. She seemed like a lovely person. She's just a, a loving mum, baby in pram, happy. I was probably in my 30s at that time. I was in Easter House Fire Station. A day to day incidents uh, it could be cars on fire, it could be bins on fire, it could be um, anything on fire. Uh, if it could be burned, the locals <laughs> tended to burn it at the time. I was awakened to shouts of help. Initially, I didn't take much notice of any. Um, shouts for help because it's quite common for families to argue and couples to get drunk and domestics to break out. But the help, um, I suppose, came a lot stronger, a lot louder, a lot more frantic. And then it was more than one person. I opened the window and I shouted, um, what's wrong? And they shouted, fire, fire. I went running to the living room um, and I phoned the fire brigade. So we were going to the dwelling house and fire. Persons reported meant there was people in the house. That was the adrenaline started kicking out. I went back into the bedroom and I woke my younger sister up. Probably now I probably regret waking her up to see what she saw, but I didn't know. Oh, I think I felt afraid at the time. And I'm on. Both me and my sister were kind of shell-shocked and helpless. I saw the window get through open and I saw a gentleman climbing up um, and I saw him jump out the window. I came down to T-junction uh, and basically I looked along the street. I could see uh, there was flames. We were just out patrolling, as we usually did. It came out over the radio. The report of a fire, and the minute they told us where it was, I had no doubt it was Andy's house. There was a lot more commotion, there was a lot more voices, there was a lot more screams, there was a lot more shouting. I did notice that other neighbours were waking up, other people were starting to gather. I was kind of relieved because I felt maybe grown ups could take charge. We could see the flames at the door. But if the flames are at the door, um, it usually means that uh, the inside of the house is well alight. I went to go up the stairs, and it's just at that, Andrew was getting helped down by another fireman. He was with charcoal. His, all he had on was a pair of wife fronts, and his skin was black. I got a hold of it. I said to the fireman, I said, I'll take him. He was adamant that it was OK. And I thought, well, you don't look OK, that's for sure. 
He says, right, Wes, you know who done this. You know who done this. He was swearing and all. He was really, obviously, angry. And uh, I said, well, you take, who done it, who done it? And he wouldn't say. We had no doubt at all that he was referring to the, the guys like T.C. Campbell, McGraw. The, the, these were the, the main men. They were the guys with all the power to get everything done. And the leading firemen had the daughters whose child it was. They were the worst burnt because they were nearest the fire, because the main fire was at the door in the hallway. The blaze would have been bad enough, but the thick smoke that would have belched, not just from the door, but also from the articles that were in the cellar, because there were old paint pots and there was some timber. Um, the thick, thick smoke would have just engulfed that flat. She managed to push the bed across to create a gap and push the child down there, and she was lying on top of him. So that was the way she was found. The breeding apparatus men, when they got into the, the second room, it was, um, they were sliding the bed waiting to fight. And the shock does that, and they managed to calm them down and get them out, but they were pretty badly burnt as well. In those days, an ambulance was just a, almost like a glorified taxi. The ambulance drivers were just drivers. They weren't paramedics like they are today, so there was no real treatment of them at the scene. My colleague, he found the baby under the mother. Because it was a child, he was going to do his damnness to try and save it. And he put the oxygen mask on the child, and he stayed with that child all the way to the hospital. The child was still alive at that time, and it handed it over, which is what his mission was at that point. The, the divisional officer turned up. He basically took over the incident. He photographed every room because he was aware that it could be a malicious fire due to the evidence that he was seeing. I think it was painfully obvious that somebody had poured probably petrol. I would have went for petrol. We knew right away when we saw Andy getting brought out. You can't put anything through his windows because they're way up, two storeys up, uh, and you can't reach out from the balcony. So the only way you can do anything is through the litter box. Whoever did that meant it to burn the whole place down. No doubt about that. The next morning, obviously when the light, the sun comes up in the light, it's reality, hit home. Most of the windows were smashed. There was evidence of blood running down the windows and down the wall, um, which was a constant reminder. It was that was that was always there till we left that house. That would never that never left. So that never left me. Um, even to this day, I can still see that. That's as clear as day for me. Two people have died in a fire last night in Glasgow. Seven others were injured, and police say there were suspicious circumstances. In the evening times where I worked, the first shift was at seven in the morning. And you, the first thing you did was check with the police and the fire about any incidents overnight. And possibly back in the 50s and 60s, there were more house fires. But these are gradually reduced. And so it was unusual to go out to a fire where there was a number of deaths. But of course, at the time of the fire, there was only two people had died. The fire broke out early this morning and police believe it may have been started deliberately. Other families were evacuated from the building as firemen fought the blaze. Police and firemen are now trying to discover exactly how the fire started. But my mum didn't allow us to watch the news on it. But I think I felt I needed to know. So I asked people, so I asked, Classmates, I asked people at school, 
what what they say in the news, what this and so that's how much that's when I learned how many people had died in the fire. I couldn't believe it to be quite honest. It, it just it was it was not something that would ever cross your mind as to something that could happen to a driver of one of our vans. Uh, I was horrified. It was as bad as you could get. We know what, what the criminals are like and we know what they do to each other, but this is a different thing altogether, that you take the life of a family. What was also unusual is that the police knew immediately that this was a murder. There was no other explanation other than it was started deliberately. I looked out and one of the boys had jumped out the window. That was Stephen. He jumped out the window. So I jumped into the middle room, grabbed a quill and ran down and put it over him. What did you see when you got downstairs? No, well, when I came back upstairs, I seen the smoke and it was flames everywhere. No mobile phones, so there was a, a, a radio car sitting there at 7 o'clock in the morning. You jump in and go out there you uh, interview as many of the uh, of the neighbours as you can. And there were people out in the street, and all you would, could do is talk to them, who were just telling you about the shop, telling you about the family. It was then you realised that this was a, a, a major crime had been, had been committed, just a couple of miles from the city centre, in an area that people didn't know. When I came back to Easter House the following day, the serious crime squad, the place was filled with them. And there was also, there was detective superintendents, there was detective chief inspectors, because this had to be sorted. This had to be cracked. We went out to Easter House Police Station, had a chat with the, the CID there, and afterwards we decided, by this time it was lunchtime, and we decided to go into a pub for a bit of lunch, and we went into the lounge. The lounge was very quiet. There was only ourselves and one other couple in it. And we overheard people in the bar talking about the fire and the family being bumped to death, literally. And everybody, it was common knowledge. Everybody said, oh, that's TC, he's behind that. So it, was, it wasn't just a rumour, it was common knowledge that Thomas Campbell was literally try, trying to intimidate drivers by heavy violence. Very quickly, there were all kinds of allegations about it was a, a feud in between um, ice cream war people and people were beginning to uh, name names. But of course, it's all very well naming names. You know, they needed to have the, the evidence there. And people were frightened. Um, they were frightened that they might be a target if they spoke out. From a newspaper point of view, you have a daily checks book of stories that you're constantly following up. So every day, every newspaper was phoning the police saying, where are you? Where are you going with this? Where are you going with this? Everywhere there is evidence of a close-knit family. Discarded clothing and overturned furniture, mute testimony to their panic as they struggled to flee the flames and the choking smoke. The police were quite upfront that there was no criminality involved in the, in the family. Uh, this was just a decent Glasgow family that had been targeted. So there was a, a real revulsion in the city that somebody could go up to a door in the middle of the night, in a flat where there was no other escape method other than jumping out of a, a window. I remember being at school and I think um, one of the friends said, oh, the baby had died. I think it was just disbelief. Um, I was hoping that the rescue would have been successful then, but... And as soon as there are children involved, there is a huge public interest in the case. And people want to know 
how this could have happened, why it happened. Police are treating as murder the deaths of three people in a fire at their Glasgow home. Six other members of the same family were injured. The dead were 14-year-old Anthony Doyle, his married sister Christine Halloran, age 25, and her one-year-old son, Mark. Big, big pressure. Everybody was shocked. There's no doubt about that. There was nobody thought it was funny. Nobody thought it was anything but a disgrace. The investigation was run by um, a detective called Charlie Craig and also Norrie Walker, who was another experienced detective. So they, they were in overall charge, but there was a vast number of, of experienced officers involved and who were determined to try and get whoever it was that had done this. Charlie Craig was a, a larger than life fig character. Uh, he wanted instant action, you know, and he was a man, he, whatever he said, that was, it was done. Extremely able officer, one of the best I've ever seen at conducting, there may be a murder inquiry with 80 officers, Charlie could sit there and pick out who to do what job. Extremely good leader of men, I liked him, a lot of people didn't, I did. Charlie Craig was known to close cases. There were other very competent officers who would um, investigate the crime, but Charlie Craig was well known to be a closer. Norrie Walker was the boss at the Northern Division. He was a detective superintendent, old school, very determined to go out and get the bad man in, but an excellent police officer. Uh, you must appreciate that when you have something of this, a crime of this nature, then you must explore all avenues. It would be knocking on doors to start with, collecting as much information as you can, finding out where everybody was and getting that, a sort of bird's eye view of everything at that time. We believe that someone in that area saw or knows something and we would like that person to get in touch with us, come forward. We'll, we'll respect their confidence. They were afraid. They were very afraid because if they give a witness statement that meant something, at the end of the day, they were going to have to stand up in the high court and speak up against those people. And slowly but surely, they, they began to focus on the ice cream van link. Is there anything to indicate that there's any business rivalry involved in this overall incident? Well, we're keeping this in mind. We're keeping this in mind, but you must bear in mind that there are three members of this family critically ill, and we haven't been able to interview them. We were used because we knew all the drivers. The drivers who had no criminality, they didn't know anything. They were quite just lucky it wasn't them. There was nobody saying, well, you know who done that. We had a good idea, but no proof whatsoever. I mean, the police were quite sure that Tam McGraw had something to do with it. Charlie Craig pulled him in, and according to McGraw's autobiography, he screamed in his face, you did it, but then nothing comes of it. My understanding was that he, he had uh, an, an alibi about buying a car, which um, took him out of the, the case. It was quite clear the police were looking at anybody with a criminal background involved in this, and the fact that they zeroed in on uh, T.C. Campbell was um, probably good enough for the, the media that the, he, he was the ringleader rather than anyone else. The vans went out the following day. If they're missing for one night, then some, another driver could take his van in. It was always imperative that the vans were out seven days a week. When I seen the, them going away that night, um, you can take quite a bit of burden on your skin. The father and the sons and all that, I thought they would survive, albeit, you know, uh, they were badly burned. As the days went on and other people died, it just it was a continuous front-page story for 
uh, over a week. To be honest, I was, I thought they would be okay. I thought they would be burned, get them down to the Royal, get them seen to, and eventually they would come out, but it just didn't happen. Part of the problem is that you can take quite a bit of burn on your skin, but if you're taking superheated air into your lungs, you actually get worse after the fire and your lungs swell up. Uh, so this is why at the time of fire you can still be alive, but two or three days later you might die from it. Just three members of the Doyle family survived the fire. The police would have moved into anywhere that, that inquiries led them. So if, if somebody had something that they wanted to tell them, then naturally they would go, and that would lead them to Berlini eventually, and Sea Hall in particular. On this particular occasion, it led them to um, William MacDonald Love, who apparently said that he had something to tell them. Billy Love was in Sea Hall on remand for a, a, an armed robbery, um, which he denied. And he said to the police that he had information regarding the Doyle family murder. William Love was well known to the police and was uh, well known to have been able to wheel and deal his way in and out of uh, situations. And perhaps um, his evidence should have been taken very much with, if not a, a pinch of salt, a whole carton of salt. What he told them was that he had been in a bar in the East End of Glasgow on a particular night when he heard Thomas Campbell and Joseph Steele and others discussing setting fire to Fat Boy's door. Fat Boy being the way that they talked about Andrew Doyle. It was, I was only young and I was enjoying life and whatever. I had my girlfriend, I had my way in and things like that. It was a summer, and it was the 16th of April, and I was lying in my bed, and I was no well. And uh, I was listening to my granny's, she had a wee radio with BHF on it, with music in the early post and things like that, taxis, whatever. And it came out saying there was a fire on Bank End Street, and occupants trapped. I actually heard all that on the, wee, on the radio. Maybe a week or so, maybe a wee bit more, when they get round here, or dead everybody, basically. Please. Pulled me on the quest for a couple of things. I think I'd been in two, two or three times or in with different coppers asked me things and that, and then I was heading there after what after what. On the day of the, the Doyle funeral, uh, of course the press turned out en masse, but so did the local community. It was very busy on the estate, on the, it was absolutely jam-packed. There was press, there was hundreds of people. I'll take the piece of camera over there, shall we? Right. I was one of several reporters who would have covered the more major stories in these days. As somebody who wanted to get on in my career, I was more than willing to cover the stories that people were interested in. Father Lindsay, what sort of family were the Doyles? Well, I didn't know them very well myself, but from what I hear from the other parishioners, they were a very good family, very hard-working family, very close family. When you're a reporter there, you're staring into the eyes of the surviving members of the Doyle family, and you're seeing the tragedy that has befallen them. You're also aware that the youngest victim of this crime was an 18-month-old child, Mark. That was about exactly the same age as my daughter, Victoria. I went to St. Philip's Primary School, which was facing the church where the funeral was held. Um, and I remember it, the 
closing the curtains, trying to, for us not to look out the windows. I think some boys from our school was doing their um, altar boys, which so they were telling us that there was only five coffins and that the baby was in the same coffin as his mum. All I can recall is that the family were willing for us to film. I, I realised it would cover the cortege as it came through the streets of Rohesi, but I was surprised to learn that day that they allowed us and wanted us inside the church. My recollection was watching this funeral take place from a balcony, looking down on it. So you're witnessing something terrible that's befallen this family, and you can see all the relatives and the way they're reacting. We as writers like to think that it's our words that make a difference, but really at the funeral, it was the powerful images, first of that sheer fleet of black funeral cars in the cortege taking these coffins to the church and to the, the graveside. And you saw this row of five coffins in front of the congregation. These were very strong images which affected people so much. It made them think, imagine that happening to my family. You just couldn't. We feel sometimes that perhaps God has abandoned us by allowing such a thing to happen. There was no one in the city was not affected, affected by that. In just a few minutes of horror, Mrs. Lillian Doyle lost her husband, three sons, James, Andrew and Anthony, a daughter, Christina, and her 18-month-old grandson, Mark. I think it was six weeks later, uh, first of June. Uh, I got charged and left in charge. They were taking me down to Bear Street and we were going along the motorway. The copper said to me, that's what you've done, you cunt. That's what you've done, and I look back. And all the windows were all smoking, you mean? I suppose I'd, I'd never set eyes on the whole family says, ever. Detectives were told in no uncertain terms, if you don't get somebody for this, you'll be back in uniform. Witnesses in what has been Scotland's biggest multiple murder trial. ...controlling a major sector of the city's... ...charges ranging from attempted murder to assault and robbery. Probably one of the biggest trials that Scotland has ever seen. Two men have been sentenced to life imprisonment. I thought the right men would be convicted. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I hope you rot in hell. I don't think any of us thought we were going to get in. Late this afternoon, he used handcuffs and super glue to attach himself to the railings of the palace. I enjoyed that. It's the first time I'd ever left Scotland, actually. The Secretary of State has decided to refer the cases of the so-called Ice Cream Wars murderers back to the appeal court. If you have much acquaintance with the criminal justice system, you learn very quickly not to expect too much. I still think that woman to this day, that whole family to this day. They don't even know who done it.